Hey team, we have a new sponsor here at the Crypto Conversation. Yes, indeed, it is BitGet, which is one of the world's leading uh, copy trading crypto exchanges. So if you've got the funds to invest, uh, but you don't perhaps have the time to track all of the coins in the market, what do you do? Well, you go to BitGet. BitGet is an excellent solution because uh, the BitGet copy trading platform has over 80,000 elite traders uh, to choose from and 380,000 followers, people like yourself who are already using the BitGet copy trading platform uh, to trade, make their trades and earn a potential passive income stream. So if that sounds like you and you want to sign up, well, if you sign up uh, now using the link in the show notes, you get a free 50 bucks in USDT as a trading bonus if you trade over $50. So just use the link below uh, to sign up and get that bonus. And now it is on with the show. My guest today is Josh Olshowicz. Josh, of course, is the head of research at Valkyrie Funds. But Josh used to be head of research here at Brave New Coin, uh, you're probably familiar with Josh's work from, well, from here at Brave New Coin, from uh, Valkyrie Funds, and from a Crypto Twitter. Hey, welcome back to the show, Josh. Andy, it's great to be here. Uh, can I tell a long-winded story? Please. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's open. This is a podcast, right? Yeah. So uh, Monday, this is like completely serious. So Monday. Um, Every Monday, internally, I give these investment committee calls or that I'm part of that I give this presentation. We've been talking a lot about inflation every week. And, and uh, I was looking at these, these restaurant menus and I'd remembered this Reddit post uh, about Denny's. And then I'd remembered that New Zealand has a Denny's in like the heart of downtown, right? Yes, we do. <laughs> it is, it's still there, right? I'm assuming, but I don't yep. know. I don't know why I thought of that, but just like how random that is of all the restaurants. Because Denny's, for those who don't know, it's kind of like Waffle House or it's kind of like this like low-end diner food, right? I don't know what it is in New Zealand. I, I didn't go. But <laughs> anyway, yeah. the point is, I was thinking, man, it's so weird that there's a Denny's in the heart of downtown New Zealand. And I wonder how they're doing. And then you you contacted me and here we are. Here we are indeed. So it's been a, a year or two, I suppose, even longer uh, since uh, yeah, we've had you on, on Brave New Coin. So, so good to have you here, Josh. Why don't you just give us a, give us a quick update on kind of what you're up to at the moment and, and what you've been doing just so we can uh, get that done. And, and then we'll just, I don't know, talk about Bitcoin, I, I imagine. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So like, as you said, I work for uh, Valkyrie funds. We have uh, ETFs. We have single asset trusts. We also have a hedge fund that I help uh, manage or am a part of managing. It's mainly focused on discounted crypto equities. So that's been a lot of fun. And uh, for Valkyrie, I do a lot of the content or you know, I put out tweets and uh, everything about Bitcoin. And we do weekly uh, research pieces that you or your audience may have, may have seen out there in the ether. Um, and a lot of it is kind of different. So when I was at BNC and Tech and Me, a lot of that was sort of talking to the crypto audience, the crypto native audience. Coming over to Valkyrie, it's been a lot of trying to educate the uh, like institutional folks or the, the non-crypto natives, right? The traditional TradFi side of, and that's been interesting um, in a good way. You know, they're both completely different types of people, right? Uh, crypto natives will throw their money at anything, <laughs> whereas uh, you know TradFi folk have a very specific mandate. Typically, they can only do certain things, extremely low on the risk tolerance, and they want to make sure they know everything about an investment before they get into it. You know, uh, so that's that's what I help do is help educate uh, non-crypto people. Yeah, nice. Uh, that's interesting, Josh. So. Has that kind of changed your view in terms of, I suppose, you know, how easy it is for uh, the more traditional side of uh, the financial capital allocators? Because 
is it, how easy is it for them really uh, to to look at crypto? And especially, you know, given that we've been in a, a bear market for a little while, they will have gone uh, colder again. Um, are you still bullish on uh, that uh, notorious uh, Wall Street wall of money eventually finding its way into uh, crypto in larger and larger waves? Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely bullish on the long term. I mean, I don't know who who would be here if you weren't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the big thing that the non-crypto people want to see and you have to help them understand is like, what is the utility? That's, that's always the question, the first question, right? Because they see what they see in the news, which is what most people see in the news. Like, you know, all this meme coin stuff, Dogecoin and NFTs and this kind of like silly, whimsical nonsense that at the end of the day, for most people, isn't going to move the needle on their decision-making process to, to get into an investment. You know, so they want to see they want to see Bitcoin in a portfolio. They want to see it against uh, equities, against the fixed income. They want to see it against S&P and NASDAQ. They want to see correlations. Is it, what is it? Is it gold? Is it real estate? Is it oil? Is it a commodity, right? Um, so I help gather and manage and visualize all that data to help inform them. You know, this is, it's a, the, the answer is Bitcoin's a chameleon. So it's kind of everything. It, everything everywhere all at once right <laughs> it is it is anything it wants to be at any given time um right now it's it's very gold like in its behavior and very uh inverse to the dxy we can get to that later but you know that that definitely wasn't always the case last year or the year before it was highly correlated to equities s p nasdaq which some people liked some people hated some people didn't want to be involved in a essentially derivative of the NASDAQ. Uh, that's how they felt. Um, a lot of people, again, the volatility, that, that's the other, really the first thing is utility. Number two is volatility. Um, a non-crypto native doesn't understand uh, where the volatility comes from on any given day. And I think they have, a, they have trouble seeing like the risk adjusted return and taking it seriously. Because a lot of, for a lot of, folks you know that's that's a problem yeah the volatility certainly uh, uh can be intense uh, the first time you experience it to the downside certainly uh good fun on the upside but uh, speaking of that volatility or lack thereof uh josh you know uh i was actually just watching i watched your your recent market update uh for valkyrie yesterday just to kind of catch up with uh your technical analysis and, and what's going on. And, you know, you were talking about how uh, the market really is uh, a little bit flat and boring at the moment. You know, Google Trends uh, search data fallen back to, I think, you know, pre-2021 levels. And it's the same across, you know, a lot of the other metrics uh, you always watch, such as uh, exchange volumes, DeFi volumes. And, you um, yeah, lack of volatility. Bitcoin seems to be kind of stuck in this range at the moment, just sort of between 26 and, and 30K for, a, what, two months now? Yeah, what's that expression? Uh, if you can't handle me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, crypto, historically, digital assets, Bitcoin has these periods where it is just uh, doldrums, flat, you know, all good news is bad news. All bad news is terrible news, right? <laughs> and we are we are in that now. Um, the good news is if you zoom all the way out, which I try to tell people, not just because it's like super rosy, but for these long-term capital allocators who are the, typically the Trad5 folks, um, to show them, you know, this, this four-year cycle, right? What is crypto? What has Bitcoin done relative to the halving? What does that look like? What could you potentially think about as far as what to expect? You know, it's a dangerous game to play. Uh, you know, past results don't predict the future, but they do rhyme. And we do have a having coming up in less than a year, a little less than a year. And we typically see activity like we are seeing now in pre-having years where it's just boring, low engagement, you know, no one cares about anything. <laughs> we just came off of like the biggest scam nonsense uh, in history with uh, SPF exploding and 3AC and Celsius. And again, th those are the headlines that people who aren't in crypto are still seeing. They're still seeing all these headlines regarding SPF. I mean, I see them 
every day, right? It's uh, yesterday. It was uh, something about the U.S. wants to drop charges if it disagrees with the Bahama Bahamanian uh, regulator. Uh, and then today it was something about him claiming legal advice was the reason he committed crimes. <laughs> but the point is, it's like every day there's this reminder that oh yeah, by the way, this really bad stuff happened, right? <laughs> Yeah, so, it's, it, it's like a, it's almost like a blur. But thinking back now to uh, that that period when all of those, you know, five or six of the really too big to fail kind of blue chip crypto brands uh, slowly uh, sucked the life out of each other, and um, yeah, it's amazing to. Uh, see that you know here we are and bitcoin has kind of recovered uh and just keeps on trucking admittedly uh with low volatility at the moment but really josh you know talking about the the halving it really as much as um it's you kind of think well everyone knows about the halving now but i don't know maybe the cycle it's still too early and and we will see that kind of same uh pattern play out but what having 10 10 months to go roughly now yeah, and I don't mean to like sweep under the rug all the bad stuff that happened because people need to know, right? People need to know that there of are course. risks, that custody matters, that there are people such as me, such as Valkyrie, such as BNC, who've you know avoided all this nonsense as a company. We avoided uh, 3AC, we avoided um, FTX, we avoided you know everybody, Celsius, Block Five, Voyager, right? Like. So well, speak, there speak are for yourself, Josh. I had uh, Alex uh, Mashinsky. He has been on the crypto pod, crypto conversation podcast twice okay. now. I believe. But you know, this is when we still thought he was a good actor. Uh, but you know, okay, okay. Well, <laughs> so my point is, there are people who have looked at this stuff while it, while it was hotter than hot, and have yeah. said, you know what, something's not right here. This doesn't add up. And as we were doing DD on these companies last year or the year before i can't remember now um i guess it was 2022 we were doing dd on on i was and i was looking at these companies thinking like okay like where does this yield come from the classic question and like it wasn't ever clear right like who <laughs> if you don't know where the yield is you are the yield that's i guess the saying but um it, it was never clear to me even in a lot of DeFi, like where's this yield coming from you know some of the DeFi yield has always been token issuance so like maple is, is the immediate example that comes to mind where it'll give you a yield but that's actually some low baseline yield plus like giving you maple tokens right so you just have to be careful and really know what you're getting into and what to expect <laughs> yeah well this is what i've always liked about you josh is and look i'm not going to try and put words in your mouth but um you know one of the ways i've always thought that you view crypto is uh you really like bitcoin uh and then you're increasingly suspicious if not downright skeptical of almost everything else that happens in crypto and uh, i think you know if these uh, more traditional or institutional investors are, are looking at crypto, is that still the best place for them to start uh, with Bitcoin and then um, be a little bit skeptical as you go further down uh, the market cap table? Yeah, I think it's definitely the best place to start. It's got the, the best history. It has the most data that you can look at. It has a track record of excellence as far as security is concerned. It has the best uptime. I mean, you can go on and on and on, right? It's it's realistically the only proof of work network on the planet. I mean, that's it, right? We can talk about Litecoin or Dogecoin or some of these other <laughs> no. joke networks, but yeah, the reality is it's Bitcoin and uh, that's the only thing left in the proof of work realm, which I think is a huge benefit to Bitcoin where it doesn't really have competition uh, for electricity or ASICs or whatever. The, I guess the, the risk of that, of course, Josh, is it being the largest proof of work network, it is then the most energy intensive uh, network, which makes it a target for, um, you know, a, a certain uh, sector of the population, of government, 
you know, people like Greenpeace and who are funded <laughs> by Ripple, apparently attacking Bitcoin. Um, and I guess that's a roundabout way of saying from the outside looking in, and I'm sure, you know, this won't have escaped your attention, Josh, but it feels like uh, uh, the Biden administration, perhaps not the Biden administration, but the... Uh, the you can say it, it's the Biden administration. <laughs> okay, the, Bi the Biden administration and, and yeah. uh, the, the people under that um, yeah, well, bureaucracy at the moment, yeah. uh, they, yeah. they seem to be, uh, yeah, attack, not attacking Bitcoin, but making it, they're, they're squeezing crypto, aren't they, Josh? Yeah, the regulators haven't been friendly to us um, as even, you know, as, as an individual, it's getting tougher to like figure out how to get in and out of exchanges. But um, yeah, they're definitely squeezing crypto in the United States, which maybe at the end of the day will be good for Bitcoin. Um, a lot of people are saying like, oh, is Gary Gensler some secret like mega pro Bitcoiner? Like it could be, that could be the case. Um, but we're yeah, the, the regulations are definitely tightening here. We're seeing more and more Activity go offshore, volumes go offshore, um, interests go offshore. I think the EU today just signed their uh, MICA law as far as uh, you know the crypto rules of the road. Even that is like flawed, but at least it's clear to the people operating in that jurisdiction what the rules of the road are. Uh, and that's really been a problem in the US as far as what people can and can't do. You know, just give me, here's what I want. Are you ready? I want three spot exchanges in the U.S. that are fully regulated. And I'm not going to have to worry about like my bank connecting with them. And what what is my bank going to say? Is my bank going to debank me because I want to take money in and out of exchanges, right? So we have Coinbase, we have Kraken. <clears throat> Those are fine. But they've run into some issues with, with regulators as far as what they can and can't do. Um yeah, I don't remember what your initial question was, but yes, the the, the Biden administration is hostile. Yeah, and what and what's fascinating also though is um, it feels like you know crypto is becoming a, a slightly less of a pure partisan divide because you do have uh, politicians from uh, both sides of the aisle that are. Uh, negative crypto or becoming uh, champions of crypto and you see you see people talking on crypto twitter about how you know the, uh, the the crypto voting block will be a major power player in the next election and it would be suicide to campaign against crypto i think it's probably maybe a, an election cycle or so too soon for that really to be the case but it is fascinating nonetheless josh to see um yeah the, the pro uh, especially pro Bitcoin candidates come out, and uh, also, of course, you know, with the this kind of uh, fracturing, if you like, of of America into these uh, really lots of different stuff happening in different states. But of course, uh, states like Texas um, and Wyoming, of course, becoming uh, yeah pro crypto. I guess. Yeah, back to the mining piece. The, the interesting thing about Bitcoin mining as a whole, it's like what 0.1 to 0.3 percent of total energy uh, product energy usage in the in the world. Like it is such a microscopic percentage, but it gets this outsized attention. I think because it it has like a visible footprint. It has data that is easily accessible as far as how much you know, how big is the hash rate, right? We don't have like great data on exactly what most of the miners are doing, but we have some fuzzy data that's getting better as far as greening up the network. Uh, Daniel Batten of uh, New Zealand does some great work on that. Um, but yeah, there, I think there is, like you said, both a fracturing and a uh, kind of bipartisan. It's kind of weird, you know, like we're seeing a lot of states stand up for Bitcoin mining specifically. And then we're seeing other states like New York, who's like, no, you can't have any more miners using fossil fuels. And it's funny that plant Coindesk did this great article on uh, that plant in upstate New York. I don't know if you saw that article I'm referring to, but um, it laid out like what the plan is, what it did, what it's doing now. And when, you know, how none of it mattered until Bitcoin got involved and all of a sudden everybody cared about it, right? It became this huge deal because Bitcoin became attached to it. In reality, it gives electricity back to the grid and it's a it's a net benefit for, for the people who live there yeah it's the same way the uh the biden administration 
uh, had that kind of headline about the closing the loophole for uh, for crypto traders just because they just wanted to uh, target crypto traders because it's um it's an easy uh, villain I suppose. <laughs> yeah, and there was another um, there was another bill a, a while back, the infrastructure bill, where there's some crypto clause that was like potentially going to get added to that. So I think there's somebody at the top who's like thinks that crypto is this boogeyman or it pulls really well if we go after crypto people. <laughs> I don't know what that distinction is because it's kind of odd. Like it's hyper specific, right? For like the yeah. president of the United States to be calling out a specific type of, they call it like wash trading or um, tax loss harvesting, but sure. It's like, go ahead, close it. Like, fine. But like, what is the big deal? You know, like, <laughs> I don't know why we're being singled out here as we're like the bad guy. Um, Anyway, and and Bobby Kennedy, uh, meanwhile, pro Bitcoin. Yeah, RFK Jr. coming out as uh, pro Bitcoin. He has some interesting views on a lot of things. He does, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it is good to see somebody in our corner at the very least, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know in New Zealand if it's as tenuous uh, in your legislative legislative bodies as far as you know, Bitcoin is concerned. Have they commented at all on any of that? On Bitcoins just generally? Yeah, because I, I thought there was like some initiatives for mining in New Zealand. Uh, I know there was an ETH miner in New Zealand a, a while back, but... I, I mean, sure, there may be little uh, miners here and there, but no, I don't think there's... Uh, we don't really get uh, the very government or regulators talking about it, except uh, from a, a tax perspective at the moment. Gotcha. Um, I want to just look at some possible triggers for when, you know, the market might start to, to move, Josh. But while you're here, let's just get your views on Bitcoin ordinals, um, because... <laughs> Oh God! I imagine just just brief. I imagine uh, that, that you know. I said you're 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 pro Bitcoin and skeptical of everything else, but I'm going to pick that you are skeptical ordinals. Yeah. So here's the thing: um, the time to lobby against something like ordinals was when it was added to the code as yeah. a possibility back in November 2021. You know, the, the time to dis, to debate this was before before November 2021. I remember writing about it for Brave New Coin, Taproot. At the time, it was sort of built up as this huge change for Bitcoin and no one ever used it. No one used it for years. No one cared about it for years. <laughs> and all of a sudden... Um, then we had the NFT boom on Ethereum. <laughs> then we have the <laughs> NFT boom. Uh, and then, you know, everything sort of dies down. And, and on Bitcoin, uh, Casey, I forget his last name, starts with an R, Rotomore or something. Yeah. Um he sort of puts forth this this way to use Taproot to make NFTs on Bitcoin, and then that starts off this whole rigmarole about <laughs> minting NFTs. But um, as long as it's allowable on the network, there's nothing anybody could do about it. Nothing. Uh, so you could be upset about it. You can call it all sorts of names and say it's graffiti, and that's fine. But at the end of the day, nothing can really stop it from happening. Uh, it's great for the miners. It's great for the security budget of the, the blockchain. I think it does dilute the message of, you know, the narrative around Bitcoin as far as why we're here. You know, I'm certainly not here for get rich quick NFTs, right? <laughs> I don't know about you, but that's not why I entered into Bitcoin. I like that it's bringing developers, it's bringing eyeballs, it's bringing attention to the chain when there's a very low, you know, very low uh, attention generally. But uh, there's nothing I can do about it, right? So I can't really get upset about it. It's just like, it's kind of like this Luna Terra algorithmic stablecoin stuff where it just gets this crazy amount of attention. And I'm just thinking, of, sitting here thinking like, this is a complete scam nonsense. Like, like why bother? You're just wasting your time and money on this stuff, right? So that's what confuses me. That's what, uh, yeah. I don't know about you. What do you what do you think about the ordinal stuff? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a little bit the same, and I, I I suppose it'll be interesting to see what happens because you know with the the volumes of NFT trading on 
you know, pick your chain, Ethereum, Solana, et cetera, at the moment, of course, uh, you know, just absolutely fallen off a cliff um, compared to right. where they were. And so I just wonder if, if the same thing will happen uh, to ordinals. It's not to say, of course, that we won't have another highly speculative NFT market again. You know, we probably will in some form. Um, but yeah. I, yeah, it'll I, come back. Yeah. It's it's the uh, the Obi-Wan Kenobi quote about the sand people. Uh, they'll be back in greater numbers. You know, <laughs> remember that scene? <laughs> like yeah. That, yeah. That's what N NFTs on Bitcoin are going to be. It, it is going to clog the chain. There's zero doubt about it in my mind. Um, when things get crazy bullish, you're going to see all these people minting 35,000 different varieties of, of NFT. And, and yeah, things are going to get interesting. Yeah, I guess the one thing I would say is, you know, at a certain point, I didn't have a problem spending a little bit of Ethereum buying some NFTs, but I've never, never been tempted to spend any Bitcoin <laughs> buying uh, <laughs> any ordinals or NFTs or whatever you want to call them, you know? Yeah, I, um, I, they've just never been for me, but I'm not really like an art person. I know that's not the, the, necessarily the point of them. The point, I think, the reality is uh, speculation. So, but yeah. you can't go to somebody like a serious institutional investor and say, hey, have you guys heard about NFTs? <laughs> they, <laughs> they want nothing to do with that, okay? They might find it interesting like on the periphery on what's going on and like uh, as far as, you know, Christie's, the auction house, you know, being involved and some of these are uh, objectively cool looking, right? Um, but yeah, most people, they want nothing to do with NFTs. Well, speaking of Ethereum, uh, Josh, let's, uh, yeah, just what's the uh, what's the Ethereum uh, check-in? I see that, you know, there's a lot of Ethereum being staked still, uh, less Ethereum on exchanges. Um, is Ethereum, Ethereum deflationary now is the narrative? Um, but uh, yeah, we bullish or, or bearish ETH still, Josh? So I think with ETH, how it became popular and how the price appreciated was the utility, right? Whether that was regulatory arbitrage with ICOs or some other speculative use case with uh, DeFi or NFTs. At the end of the day, the reason the price went up wasn't staking. It was because people were doing stuff with it, right? It was a, it was some degree of utility. You can argue if it was all just you know a casino, but um, they were doing stuff with it. Whereas Staking, yes, you can like, you know, take your stake and get some liquid staking derivative and uh, use it in DeFi. But you don't need to take that risk if you're guaranteeing a 4% return, right? You know, you're, you're exposed to the volatility of price on ETH, but it doesn't necessarily encourage people to, to use it. To me, it encourages people to do what people do with Bitcoin, which is hold it. Uh, which is fine, but that's not really what ETH, that's not ETH's narrative, you know? So I think there's a bit of a interesting, like, mismatch between what made ETH, ETH and what it's doing now. Um, at the same time, it's also dealing with interest rates, which are the higher, the highest they've been in 10 years. And would you rather put your money in DeFi <laughs> or would you rather just, buy some treasuries and call it a day, right? Um, you can measure this in a few ways. You can look at the DeFi rates directly, but you can also look at USDC is a great example. Um, in, in both regulatory and uh, DeFi relations, like USDC is taking a massive hit on circulating supply. So if less people are using USDC to, to pump into DeFi to do stuff, um, that also hurts Ethereum. There's just... Again, it's just another way to look at the general downtrend of uh, attention and eyeballs and that sort of thing. So ultimately, I think it's interest rates that are hurting uh, DeFi and that hurts Ethereum at the end of the day. Yeah, that is exactly right. So if that's the case, you know, then uh, we do have uh, this challenging macro backdrop, if you like, uh, Josh. Um, you know, what needs to happen uh, to break us out of this range, I suppose. Uh, given, you know, yeah, 10 months uh, to the halving, does that be, just become a, a self-fulfilling 
um, cycle, if you like, as people, you know, realize the halving is slowly getting closer and closer. Eventually, perhaps we'll get some uh, some media headlines. Doesn't really matter if they're good or bad. That will just, uh, yeah, remind people about the Bitcoin halving. And uh, yeah, just uh, good to see. I guess those Google search terms go up again. Uh, and then things just start to happen. Uh, human nature takes over, and um, boom. Yeah, there's, there has to be clarity on the regulatory side in the U.S., I think, for money to come back in in a big way. Um, I think that's, aside from uh, utility and volatility, like regulatory clarity is maybe at the top of that list. Maybe it's third on that list. I don't know. But um, when you have... The regulatory bodies in the United States, whether it be the SEC or the CFTC or whoever else sort of continuously coming after crypto in various ways, uh, that makes a lot of people nervous and they just don't want to touch it, right? They don't want to be involved. Uh, so I think that would help. That would, that would be a big benefit to people looking to get into the space. It's like, is it okay to actually do this? Right? <laughs> um, they, need, they need that at the very least, right? Yeah, I don't know. So, it's just it's just a hard. I mean, we've, we've been saying we need regulatory clarity for years and years and years, and you know Gary Gensler for the last two or three years at least has, you know, he's, I guess he said yeah, Bitcoin is a commodity, and but then he refuses to say uh, yes or no on any other asset, but essentially just say you know everything else is a security, but doesn't seem to want to deal with even the likes of uh, Coinbase. So, you know, to, to the point where you probably know more about this, Josh, but, you know, the SEC try and uh, stop Coinbase from doing anything interesting to the point where you see um, Brian from Coinbase putting on his suit and going to meet, uh, you know, various different politicians, both in the US, but also in Europe, uh, Josh, just to try and send the signal that, He's so, you know, he's so frustrated with what's going on in the US. I don't know how we're supposed to get regulatory clarity when, um, you know, there's just this ridiculous dance of musical chairs and no resolution. Yeah, we've seen some um, some bills come out of Congress in the United States. Uh, Tom Emmer has been really good at trying to pass certain things to get that regulatory clarity. Mm. Uh, whether it be you know some stablecoin bill that says if you're a stablecoin you can't be fractional your reserves have to be in a bank you, your reserves can only be X Y Z whatever it is right like it we we both need something and we also have to like be careful what we wish for because in the U S they may just say everything that isn't Bitcoin is a security everything that uses staking is a security right that could be a possibility yeah. So, and that will change the landscape dramatically in the U.S. as far as who can trade these crypto securities, which exchanges can list them, what, what exchanges need to do from a compliance perspective to get cleared to actually trade this stuff. Uh, and it's just, uh, it's a mess. Um, so, yes, any, anything, any line in the sand that says, look, if you're, if you're this type of zebra, you are an animal. <laughs> If you are not that zebra, then you're probably not a commodity, right? <laughs> I would love to see something like that. Love it. Yeah, me too. All right. Uh, Tether, Tether uh, said uh, that they are going to start allocating uh, a, a little portion of uh, their profit, I think, uh, towards buying Bitcoin, but it's a it'd be uh, not insignificant. Uh, amount of buying when when does tether uh, start uh, buying bitcoin josh and is that uh does that help hold up the market a little bit yeah there's some theories that uh the buyer of bitcoin in q1 that held up the market was tether and uh i'm just looking at their wallet and i don't hate that theory <laughs> um the potential wallet that's theirs is uh estimated to be based on what they're holding as far as how many Bitcoin they have. Um, we don't know necessarily when they bought it and when they moved it and that sort of thing, you know, but we, people have a good idea that it's probably Tether. I don't know why they just don't come out and say like, yes, this is us. This is our wallet. Um, 
anyway, I think it's good for any company to come out and say like, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna diversify our profits a little bit, right? Um, Tesla's done it. Who else has done it? There's a, there's a massive list. Uh, Michael yeah, Saylor, obviously. <laughs> Saylor, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I don't even consider him a, a company. I just think of him as like a Bitcoin, yeah. <laughs> Bitcoin company. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, there's a, there's a small but growing list of U.S. corporates. But I'd love to see that list grow for sure. Yeah, I don't know. That doesn't feel quite like the um, uh, the safe environment for a, a big uh, corporate. CFO to come out now and say, hey, we're going to diversify into Bitcoin. I'm not sure if that would be a winning strategy. Uh, but Well, I think if you're international, there's a benefit because they do deal a lot with um, FX ARB or FX risk, you know, yep. and some of that may be tamped down by holding Bitcoin or paying paying out in Bitcoin. I mean, that's that's blasphemy right now for a lot of people, but that's that's the end game right there that's utility that's real utility <laughs> global trade denominated in bitcoin in some fashion right everybody's talking about de-dollarization and bricks and all this other stuff whatever right right i just want like a small block of countries or businesses to to use bitcoin uh, to settle trade perfect love it that'd be amazing couldn't agree more yeah well, that's what we really need just uh uh yeah that uh small segment of nation states to uh to kick off uh the proverbial domino um still could happen uh, this cycle you never know but um, and outside of outside of crypto companies obviously because there are a lot of mining companies globally who do this already there are a lot of companies in china for example who pay their you their employees in tether right this this sort of thing happens already um and that's one of the reasons why tether has done so well is because it uh, has acted as a store of value for a lot of people in emerging market economies. Exactly right. All right. Well, Josh, as we start to finish off, uh, do you want to just give us a, a quick, um, I guess, snapshot TA kind of summary of uh, where you think Bitcoin is at at the moment, uh, what you see going forward when 33K, Josh, Win 100K, um, yeah, what are we looking for in, in the lead up to the halving 10 months away? Um, yeah, what's going on? Yeah, speaking of that, what's uh, when was Balaji's expiration on his, <laughs> his million dollar Bitcoin? It must be, it must be coming up. If, of course, yeah, he has, be. He, he, he did settle it, of course, with, with yeah. that bet, but yeah, um, I don't uh, know. I'll have to look. I'll yeah. have to look today. I, there was I, there was an article in CoinDesk about uh, Joe Lubin and uh, I forget his name, but they had a bet about Ethereum utility, and uh, the bet kind of sounded like it ended in a wash. But anyway, where do I think price is going in the near term? Uh, well, let me rub my crystal ball here. <laughs> Based on um, this is for near term. Based on strength of the DXY, strength of the US dollar, based on rates probably going up here in two two weeks in the United States, there's another uh, Fed meeting in two weeks where they're probably going to raise rates 25 basis points. Um, that should hurt risk assets. That should continue to push people towards treasuries, towards money markets. Uh, do you guys have money market accounts in New Zealand? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure. I, I, because somebody said in the UK they have they have something else. I don't think it's called money markets, but um, anyway, so that's going to push people out of risk, right? You, you're getting paid to hold cash. Why would you, for a certain, you know, growing segment of the population, why would you take a risk that you don't need to take if that reward is pretty high, right? It's the highest it's been in a decade or more. Um, so. That siren song of, uh, of going into treasuries and bonds and, and uh, money market accounts is hurting regional banks too, by the way, in the United States, which I'm sure you've talked about. But um, so I, th I think we'll still see movement into non-risk, which is not Bitcoin, unfortunately, but, <laughs> and that's gonna hurt, hurt price. But as far as the TA specifically, I think there's a decent case for a head and shoulders here, which is just a fancy way of saying a, like a triple top and 
an expectation for uh, lower lows in price. So we're sort of hanging out at the 200 week moving average here. And potentially we may move down to the 200 day moving average, which is somewhere around like 23K. So 33K by July is still on the table. But in the, in the near, near term, you know, who's buying here is my question. Is it US retail, US institutional? Is it Asia? Is it Europe? I don't know. I don't have a good answer. <laughs> I don't know. Um, well, I think the, the people that are buying, I mean, there are, you know, a, a large proportion of Bitcoiners, Josh, I would suggest are just, you know, simple server, simple um, stay humble and stack sets type yeah. people that just chip away with with their, their DCA and to a certain extent that maybe puts in a, a little bit of a flaw but those are the people buying and then you have someone like a, a Tether or a Michael Strategy every now and again will come in and kind of hold up the market as well and that I guess maybe that that is it it doesn't but if we just kind of go sideways for a while for a, a few months yet and the lead up to the halving as people just keep accumulating, that's no bad thing, is it? No. And it's like, you know, I'm talking about 20 something K, like who cares at the end of the day, right? Like the high end here is a 10 X from here. You know, that's realistically at the peak bull market of the next cycle, let's say a year after having, which is typically when we've seen the uh, bull market high six figures easy. You know, that's, that's the next cycle high for sure. So if you're trying to like tease apart, you know, a few percentage points <laughs> here and there, and you know, you're not thinking about long term, then uh, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I just, I have a trouble. Like, what do we focus on? Do we focus on the long term every week? Like, I can't talk about you know a year from now every week, right? People, <laughs> people want to know what's happening now, so I, I have to even balance my own analysis and you know. Give a give a balanced take that isn't just like yeah I'm bearish, I'm bearish this week guys I'm bearish just ignore it everything's fine. <laughs> yeah, of course, but um you know that that's the interesting part though, Josh. So you are still happy to think that you know nothing wrong with saying uh, a 10x is possible uh, towards the peak of the next cycle. Roughly, traditionally it's been a yeah about a year after the halving so that would put us into what, over over 200k potentially yeah i think that's that's reasonable i mean that's not based on the previous three highs that's not a reasonable a target as far as where we could go just based on ta i mean we could get wild and say like that's out of control nation states are going to start adopting bitcoin fiat is dead right that's kind of like more of the gold bug game um i'm not going to sit here and, like disagree like that is a problem because it is like I, we just saw in the united states a trillion dollars of debt is sitting on credit cards for people yeah I saw and, that. and that's at 24 percent. that is insane it is um and that's just that's just credit cards not not even our own government which is <laughs> you know the debt there is out of control which is back to balaji's point like the only way to fix this is to just print money into oblivion and you're going to have people moving to hard assets like Bitcoin. Right. Uh, so that is always in the back of my mind. I just don't know how to, I don't want to scare people and say, well, you know, like this is the only way out, but it is a way out, right. You know, it is, a, it is an escape valve. It is a, you know, pull this handle in case of emergency type thing, right? Yeah, well, it's the it's the life lifeboat as as Balaji uh, uh, framed it, and look, he did his best to scare people, um, and uh, people certainly took notice. But uh, yeah, I think he also kind of framed it as, you know, when does the uh, effectively when does the US US financial system kind of blow up? It could be uh, decades, years months or, or weeks and i think uh yeah it's just pick, pick your framing um all fair yeah, currencies go to zero eventually don't they yeah I, I just think the enemy at the gate type you know rationale is a little strong yeah. but, but having an open mind and knowing that bitcoin exists it's an option as a small percentage of anyone's portfolio right not financial advice but <laughs> but uh you know in a well-balanced portfolio it does wonders as far as uh the return 
you know, if you look at like a 60, 40 portfolio, for example, this is my uh, other, this is my institutional allocator hat. Okay. So if you look at a 60, 40 portfolio versus a 60, 40 portfolio, with a little bit of Bitcoin, it, you know, you get outsized returns based on the risk. So that's one of the angles of attack for us as far as try to get people to understand, like, you know, it's not scary. It's, it's not hard. Uh, you just have to know, you have to be ed educated just a little bit to understand what's going on. Very well said, Josh. Uh, thank you so much for coming uh, back on the show and reconnecting uh, with the Brave New Coin audience. Uh, just to finish off, Josh, yeah, anything else you want to say? Tell people where they can go and see uh, your current market updates and, and what you're up to. Yeah, so you can give me a follow on Twitter, uh, Carver and Octum. I do uh, YouTube videos for Valkyrie. I do all their content, really, uh, as well. Uh, we post that on Medium, on Twitter, at Valkyrie Funds. And uh, yeah, stay humble and stack sats. Stack sats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can't say it straight. Stay humble and stack sats. Bit of a tongue and a twister. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Josh. All the best and bye for now.